I'm Jackie Lewis, and I'm the senior minister at Middle Collegiate Church. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And I want to take a moment to welcome you to this commemoration of Good Friday. At Middle Church, we say that our worship is a celebration, but on this day, we actually pause to commemorate a somber event where Rabbi Jesus, who we have come to call Christ, the Anointed One, who came all the way down to be in the midst of us as love made flesh to teach us what it means to be human and divine, what it means to be in partnership with the Holy One, with our Creator, to heal the world and to heal our souls as well. We pause to commemorate that sometimes love itself can cause such a reaction in the universe so as to cause fear, cause anger, cause wounding, even so far as death, meaning some folks will kill to stop love from being love. So on this day, we are sharing with you one of our most beautiful, poignant Good Friday moments from our sanctuary, The Little Match Girl, featuring our Middle Church Choir, one of our actors, Elizabeth Rogers, and me, conducted by Jonathan Dudley. It is a beautiful program, and I hope it causes you to reflect on love the power of love. And because we know how this story ends, we understand that though there are some who would seek to put love to death, this kind of love, this revolutionary love, this fierce love never dies. It rises. It rises up from the grave, up from the ground, up from the hatred, up from the fires that would snuff it out. In between the dying and the rising is this time of reflection. I'll be watching with you. Let us worship the God of love, even as we reflect on death.
And so I'm gonna invite you into a time of prayer with me, and then we'll sit and I'll read the scripture, and our music, Mary Speaks, will be later on in the evening. Won't you join me in a word of prayer? Holy and loving God who is still speaking to us, how we thank you for the whisper of your word in our ears, a word that stills our souls and calms our fears, a word that comforts us in times of grief. How we thank you, loving God, for your word that became flesh and made his dwelling place in the midst of us. Thank you that in his humanity, Jesus knows what it's like to be us, to laugh, to cry, to mourn, to feel forsaken. Thank you that he laid his life down that we might live, and thank you that in his divinity he took his life up again. And those of us who live between the now and the promised not yet, thank you for his faithfulness and yours, O oh God. And we ask on this Holy Friday that we might find meaning in this story for our own deaths the things that die, the things we grieve and lose. And that we also, God, might find hope in the space of tomorrow. Bless this evening and help us each to find what we came to seek tonight. In your holy and powerful name, amen. amen. You may be seated. Friends, this is one of those scriptures that you just don't want to cut in half. This is the story of those events of Jesus' life on that Holy Friday night that's found in Luke's gospel, Luke chapter 23. And I'll be reading verses 1 through 25. If you'd like to open your pew Bibles and read along with me, I invite you to do so. Luke 23 Verses 1 through 25. Listen now for a word from God in Scripture. Jesus is before Pilate. Then the assembly rose as a body and brought Jesus before Pilate. They began to accuse him, saying, We found this man perverting our nation, forbidding us to pay taxes to the emperor, and saying that he himself is the Messiah, a king. And Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, you say so. Then Pilate said to the chief priests in the crowds, I find no basis for an accusation against this man. But they were insistent and said, he stirs up the people by teaching throughout all Judea from Galilee, where he began even to this place. When Pilate heard this, he asked whether the man was a Galilean. And when he learned that Jesus was under Herod's jurisdiction, Pilate sent him off to Herod, who was himself in Jerusalem at that time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad, for he had been wanting to see him for a long time because he had heard about him and was hoping to see him perform some sign. Herod questioned Jesus at some length, but Jesus gave him no answer. The chief priests and the scribes stood by, vehemently accusing him. Even Herod, with his soldiers, treated him with contempt and mocked him, then put an elegant robe on him and sent him back to Pilate. That same day, Herod and Pilate became friends with each other. Before this, they had been enemies.
Jesus sentenced to death. Pilate then called together the chief priests, the leaders, and the people and said to them, you brought me this man as one who was perverting the people, and here I have examined him in your presence, and I have not found this man guilty of any of your charges against him. Neither has Herod, for he sent him back to us. Indeed, he has done nothing to deserve death. I will therefore have him flogged and release him. Then they all shouted out together, away with this fellow, release Barabbas for us. This was a man who had been put in prison for an insurrection that had taken place in the city and for murder. Pilate, wanting to release Jesus, addressed them again, but they kept shouting, crucify him, crucify him. A third time, Pilate said to them, why, what evil has he done? I found in him no ground for the sentence of death. I will therefore have him flogged and then release him. But they kept urgently demanding with loud shouts that he would be crucified and their voices prevailed. So, Pilate gave his verdict that their demand should be granted. He released the man they asked for, the one who had been put in prison for insurrection and murder, and he handed Jesus over as they wished. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I remember too much. I am like the air on a calm day as it holds itself still, letting nothing escape. Memory fills my body as much as blood and bones. As the world holds its breath, I keep memory in.
Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Sometimes I feel like a motherless I gasped when I saw the cross. They had it ready, waiting for him. It was too heavy to be carried, and so they made him drag it through the crowd. I noticed how he tried to remove the thorns from around his head a number of times, but the efforts did not succeed and seemed instead to make them further push themselves into the skin and into the bones of his skull and of his forehead. Each time he lifted his hands to see if he could ease the pain of this, some men behind him grew impatient and they came with clubs and whips to press him forwards. For a time, he seemed to forget all pain and he pushed the cross forward or pulled it. We moved quickly ahead of him. I still wondered if his followers had a plan, if they were waiting or were disguised among the crowd as we were. I did not want to ask, and it would be impossible now anyway. And I was alert that any word we said or look we gave in the frenzy of things could make us, any one of us, a victim too to be kicked, or stoned, or taken away. It was when I caught his eye that things changed. We had moved ahead, and suddenly I turned and saw that once again he was trying to remove the thorns that were cutting into his forehead and the back of his head, and failing to do anything to help himself, he lifted his head for a moment and his eyes caught mine. All of the worry, all of the shock, seemed to focus on a point in my chest. I cried out and made to run toward him, but was held back by my companions, Mary whispering to me that I would have to be quiet and controlled or I would be recognized and taken away. He was the boy I had given birth to, and he was more defenseless now than he had been then. And in those days after he was born, when I held him and watched him, my thoughts included the thought that I would have someone now to watch over me when I was dying, to look after my body when I had died. In those days, if I had even dreamed that I would see him bloody, and the crowd around filled with zeal that he should be bloodied more. I would have cried out as I cried out that day, 
And the cry would have come from a part of me that is the core of me. The rest of me is merely flesh and blood and bone. With Mary and our guide constantly telling me that I must not attempt to speak to him, that I must not cry out again, I followed them toward the hill. It was easy to fit in with those who were there. Everyone was talking or laughing, some leading horses or donkeys, others eating and drinking. The soldiers shouting in a language we did not understand, some of them with red hair and broken teeth and coarse faces. It was like a marketplace, but more intense somehow as if the act that was about to take place was going to make a profit for both seller and buyer. All the time, I felt it would still be easy for someone to slip away unnoticed, and I had a hope that his supporters might have planned a way for him to escape through this throng and out of the city to somewhere safe. But then, at the top of the hill, I saw some of them digging a hole, and I realized that the people here meant business. They were here for one reason only.
We waited, and it took an hour or maybe more for the procession to arrive. It became easy somehow to tell the difference between those who were there for a reason, who were in the pay of somebody acting on instructions, and those who were merely there as spectators. What was strange was how little attention some of them paid as others set about nailing him to the cross. And then, using ropes, tried to pull the cross toward the hole they had dug and balance it there. For the nailing part, we stood back. Each of the nails was longer than my hand. Five or six of the men had to hold him and stretch out his arm along the cross. And then, as they started to drive the first nail into him at the point where the wrist meets the hand, he howled with pain and resisted them as jets of blood spurted out. And the hammering began as they sought to get the long spike of the nail into the wood, crushing his hand and his arm against the cross as he writhed and roared out. When it was done, he did everything to stop them stretching out his other arm. One of them held his shoulder and the other the upper arm, but still he managed to hold his arm in against his chest, so they had to call for help. And then they held him and drove in a second nail so that his two arms were outstretched on the wood. I tried to see his face as he screamed in pain, but it was so contorted in agony and covered in blood that I saw no one I recognized. It was the voice I recognized, the sounds he made that belonged only to him. I stood and looked around. There were other things going on, horses being shod and fed, games being played, insults and jokes being hurled, and fires lit to cook food with the smoke rising and billowing all around the hill. It seems hard to fathom now that I stayed there and watched this, that I did not run toward him or call out to him, but I did not. I watched in horror, but I did not move or make a sound. Nothing would have worked against the quality of their determination. Nothing would have worked against how prepared they were and how fast moving. But it seems odd, nonetheless, that we could have watched, that I could have made a decision not to put myself in danger. We watched because we had no choice. I did not cry out or run to rescue him because it would have made no difference. I would have been cast aside like something blown in on the wind. But what is also strange, what seems strange after all these years, is that I had the capacity then to control myself, to weigh things, to watch and do nothing. To know that that was right. We held each other and stood back. That is what we did. We held each other and stood back as he howled out words that I could not catch. And maybe I should have moved toward him then, no matter what the consequences would have been. It would not have mattered, but at least I would not have to go over and over it now, wondering how I could not have run toward him and pulled them back and shouted out words, how I could have watched and remained still and silent. But that is what I did.
When I could, I asked how long it would take for him to die, and was told that because of the nails and the amount of blood he seemed to have lost and the heat of the sun, it could be quick. But it could still take a day, unless they came and broke his legs, and then it would be quicker. There was a man in charge, I was told, and he knew how to make the time go faster or slow it down. He was an expert. That is what he did, in the same way as others were experts in crops and seasons, the time to harvest the fruit from the trees or the time it took a child to come into the world. They could make sure, I was told, that no more blood would be spilled. Or they could even turn the cross away from the sun, or they could use spears to pierce his flesh, and this would mean that he would die within hours before nightfall. This would mean that he would die before the Sabbath. But for this, I was told, permission would have to be given by the Romans, by Pilate himself. And if Pilate could not be found, then there were always men among the crowd who could stand in for Pilate and give permission. I almost wanted to ask if there was still time to save him, if he could be rescued and still live. But in reality, I knew that it was too late for that. I had seen the nails before they went into the space between his wrists and his hands. Then I saw that other crosses were being raised with men tied to them with ropes, but the wood seemed to be too heavy or the crosses had been badly made, and each time they had them standing, the cross would slip over and fall back to the ground. I was watching anything, a cloud billowing across the sky, a stone, a man standing in front of me, anything to distract me from the moans that came from close by. I asked myself if there was anything I could do to pretend that this was not happening, that it had happened in the past to someone else, or that it was going on in a future that I would never have to live through. Because I had been watching with such care, I could tell that a group of men, some Romans, some elders, stood by the side, and they had horses, and it was how they observed the scene and circled around each other that made me realize that they were the ones in control. That many other events here were random, part of the day before the Sabbath, but these men seemed gruff, determined, well-fed, serious. Suddenly, I saw that among them was my cousin Marcus, and that he had seen me. Before the others could stop me, I ran toward him, and I knew how foolish I must have seemed, how helpless and poor and shrill. I suppose I had my arms out, and I suppose my face was wet with tears, and I suppose I made no sense. I remember the looks of indifference or mild exasperation from some of the other men being mirrored in Marcus's face and then changing into a dark brutality as he told me to get away from them. I know I did not use his name. I know I did not say that he was my cousin. I saw fear in his face, and then I saw how quickly it faded, and it changed into a determination that I would be removed from the orbit of these men whom no one else had dared approach. He nodded to someone, and it was that man who later played dice close to the hanging bodies, who became the one who watched me all the time, who seemed to know who I was, and who, I believe, had instructions to hold me, capture me, once the death had taken place and the crowd had dispersed. Later, I realized that they all believed that we would wait until the end 
to take the body and bury it. It was one thing the Romans had learned about us. We would not leave a corpse to the elements. We would wait, no matter what the danger. As many things happened in those hours as there are seconds. I moved from feeling that I could do something to realizing that I could not. I moved from being distracted by the coldest thoughts, thoughts that if this was not happening to me since I was not the one being crucified to death, then it could not really be happening at all, to thoughts of him as a baby as part of my flesh, his heart having grown from my heart. Running to the others to be held or ask questions or watching the men in case any of them made a sign that this should end more quickly. Or coming to understand that the reason Marcus had enticed me to the city 
and given me an address was so that I could be held when it was over. And then, in the last hour, as the crowd thinned out and some of the men made their way down the hill, there was no time for wondering or realizing or thinking. No time for looking around or finding ways to be distracted. In this last hour, the anguish of hanging in the sun with nails in your hands and feet seemed to grow more intense, came in fierce shrieks and then gasps. And all of us waited. All of us knew that the end was coming and all of us watched his face, his body, unsure if he knew we were there with him until close to the end, when he seemed to open his eyes and tried to speak, but none of us could catch his words, which came with too much effort for anyone to hear. They were ways of letting us know that he was alive. And strangely, despite the pain he suffered, Despite this vast public display of defeat and the fact that I had all the time desperately wanted it to be over quickly, I did not want it to be over now. As it neared the end, our guardian, his follower, told me that we would have to leave quickly once he died that others would come to look after, washing the, uh, after the washing of his body and burial, that there was a path at the back of the hill, and if we were prepared to go toward it in ones, then he could ensure our escape. But even if we escaped, he said, someone would follow us or come looking for us, so we would have to make our way through the night on foot by the light of the moon and the stars and hide each day where we could. I looked at him, as he spoke, and I saw something that I still see in him now. No grief, no sorrow, no fuss. Something cold, as though life is a business to be managed, that our time on earth requires planning and regulation and careful foresight. He is not dead yet. I said to him, he is not dead yet. I will stay with him until he dies. For a moment, I glanced over toward the men at the side. I noticed that Marcus was missing, and the man who had been following me was missing too. For a second, Puzzled, I looked behind me to see if they were leaving or had joined some other gathering. I saw them, then, both of them, and they were with the man who had been at the wedding in Cana, the strangler, and they were pointing toward me and Mary and our guardian, singling us out among the crowd. The strangler was watching and nodding calmly as each of us was identified. Later, as the years went by, I would say to myself that the decision I made then was for Mary's sake, that I realized that I had led her here and that now I was to be the cause of her being strangled I remembered what Marcus had told me. The man could do it without making a sound or leaving a mark. But it was not the possibility of Mary's death. By silent strangling, the image of her body writhing and resisting as his thumbs pushed in on her neck to break it, that caused me to run toward our guardian and to tell him that we must go now. Go, as he had said stealthily in ones, and then move fast, travel through the night to wherever we might be safe. It was my own safety I thought of. It was to protect myself. 
I was suddenly afraid. And more afraid now that the danger had edged toward me than I had been for all of those hours. It is only now that I can admit this. Only now that I can allow myself to say it. For years, I have been comforted with the thought of how long I remained there, how much I suffered then. But I must say it once. I must let the words out. That despite the panic, despite the desperation, the shrieking, despite the fact that his heart and his flesh had come from my heart and my flesh, despite the pain I felt, a pain that has never lifted and will go with me into the grave. Despite all of this, the pain was his and not mine. And when the possibility of being dragged away and choked arose, my first instinct was to flee. And it was also my last instinct. In those hours, I was powerless. But nonetheless, as I went from grief to further grief, wringing my hands, holding the others, watching with horror, I now knew what I would do. As our guardian said, I would leave others to wash his body and hold him and bury him when his death came. I would leave him to die alone if I had to. And that is what I did. Perhaps I was right to save myself when I could. But it does not feel like that now. And it never has. But I will say it now. Because it has to be said by someone once. I did it to save myself. I did it for no other reason. I followed our guardian and Mary down the hill, walking slowly, walking slowly away. Oh!
I have dreamed that I was there. I have dreamed that I held my broken son in my arms when he was all bloody, and then again when he was washed. That I had him back for that time, that I touched his flesh and put my hands on his face, which had grown beautiful and gaunt now that his suffering was over. I touched his feet and his hands where the nails had been. I pulled the thorns out of his head and washed the blood out of his hair. <coughs> they left me with him, the others, Mary and the guardian, but the others too who had come to be with him at the end, who had put themselves in danger to declare their belief in him. And we were left there with him. 
Since the grisly, vicious job had been done, and a man had been made to die, splayed out against the sky on a hill so the world would know and see and remember, those who had made him die had no more reason to remain. Thus the busy hill, so filled not long before with smoke and shouting, with cruelty and hard faces, now became a soft place for weeping. We held him and touched him, he who was both heavy and weightless, the blood all gone from his body, his body like marble or ivory in its rich paleness. His body was growing stiff and lifeless, but some other part of him what he had given us in those last hours, what had come from his suffering, remained in the air like something sweet to comfort us. I have dreamed this. And there are times when I have let the dream into the day to live with me when I have sat in that chair and felt that I was holding him, his body all cleansed of pain, and myself cleansed too of the pain that I had felt, which was part of his pain, the pain we shared. All of this was easy to imagine. It is what really happened that is unimaginable. It is what really happened that I must face in these months before I go to my grave. I do not know why it matters that I should tell the truth to myself at night, why it should matter that the truth should be spoken at least once in the world, because the world is a place of silence. The sky at night when the birds have gone is a vast, silent place. No words will make the slightest difference to the sky at night. I tell the truth not because it will change night into day or make the days endless in their beauty and the comfort they offer us, we who are old. I speak simply because I can. Because enough has happened and the chance might not come again. It will not be long, maybe, when I begin again to dream that I waited on the hill that day and held him naked in my arms. It will not be long before that dream, so close to me now and so real, will fill the air and make its way backwards into time and thus become what happened or what must have happened, what I know happened, what I saw happen. In the meantime, when I wake in the night, I want more. I want what happened not to have happened. How easily it might not have happened. How easily we could have been spared. It would not have taken much. Even the thought of that possibility comes into my body now like a new freedom. It lifts the darkness and pushes away the grief. It is as if a traveler, weary after days of walking in a dry desert, were to come to a hilltop and see below a city, an opal set in emerald, filled with plenty. I begin to walk down toward it, along a soft path. I am being led into this strange place of souls, being led by no one. The world has loosened. 
like a woman preparing for bed who lets her hair flow free. And I am whispering the words, knowing that words matter, and smiling as I say them to the shadows.
today you will be with me in paradise. I thirst. Woman, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. Today you will be with me in paradise. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. It is finished. Whenever I had a chance to revisit the beautiful artistic worship celebrations 
that we created inside the Middle Church Sanctuary. I am both proud and delighted and mesmerized, uh, but also I'm sad because our sanctuary is no longer there. So I hope you enjoyed this Good Friday worship put together by Jonathan Dudley, featuring Elizabeth Rogers and our Middle Church Choir. And as we move now into the rest of the days before Easter, I invite you to a Saturday evening vigil. Check our website out for ways to join the Zoom with our wonderful elder, Pam Edgar. And I hope also that you'll put Easter Sunday morning on your radar with Middle Church. At seven o'clock, we have a sunrise program planned, put together by our digital minister, Reverend Natalie Renee Perkins. Uh, it'll be in our socials. At 9.30 and 1145 Eastern Standard Time, you can come to East End Temple for in-person worship, two identical worship celebrations. Um, we're at 245 East 17th Street at 2nd Avenue, and there's an Easter egg hunt in between. The 1145 worship celebration will be broadcast on our channels. And 9.30 is the one to come to if you don't want to be in a big crowd. At three o'clock, we're going to uh, rebroadcast another one of our beautiful pieces. And it's our Jesus Christ Superstar production from 2019, featuring Ali Palmer from the band Betty and Michael Carcioni as Jesus, and so many incredible singers at Middle Church, including our kiddos as part of the crowd, uh, waving protest signs along with palms. From protest to palms, from sorrow to celebration, from grief to relief, joy comes on Easter morning, even as the world is hard. Joy comes on Easter morning because the God we love is fiercer than death. The God we love is more powerful than violence. And the God we love loves you back. If you're looking for a place to come and wear your Easter bonnet or your blue jeans, come be with us. We'd be delighted to have you. And even as we celebrate the risen God, the ever-living God, we're also still working on rising at Middle Church, rising from the fire. So if you're curious about how to help us rise, Go to middlechurch.org forward slash donate, and you can see our campaign and ways for you to plug in. We're hoping to be back in a big piece of our building by December of 2024. Won't you help us do that? In the meantime, God bless you and your family in these days and always. <laughs>